ended up going fruit and vegetable, mainly fruit vegan for it only lasted a couple of months because my symptoms got so bad. I was on the verge of like feeling like I was going to black out, potentially pass out. But I kind of got to this point where I was afraid to eat because every time I ate, something happened. I had to leave work to go to the ER one time because I was like doubled over in, in pain and I thought I was dying. I'd have different pant sizes in my closet depending on like how bloated I was. I had no symptoms at all. I had no psoriasis. I had no, like my brain fog went away. I felt more mentally clear than ever. I didn't even realize like how much those things were affecting me until that first 11 month period where I was like, oh, this is, this is Nia, you know? Like this is who's been underneath this whole time. All right, welcome. We have with us today uh, Nia, who is joining us from the great state of Texas. Um, Nia, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks awesome, for awesome. having me on to chat today. Yeah, so I guess you've got a little bit of a story you want to share with us uh, uh, of some sort. So I guess I'll let you just maybe start with a little bit of background on you, who you are and growing up and what, what, what sort of happened to you, I suppose. Sure. Um, well, I am currently a stay-at-home mom slash YouTuber, and I, I talk about my health journey and try to encourage and inspire other people who, you know, may be suffering with some of the things that I did um, to potentially try this way of eating and see if it can help because um, my issues really... I have kind of a long story. It started um, in my mid to late teens. Um, I would say I was having moderate to sometimes what I considered severe IBS symptoms. And I didn't really know, you know, what the cause of it was at the time. It was something that I was embarrassed about. And so I really tried to hide it and I didn't talk about it um, really with anybody. And but but that's really when I started noticing like, OK, something this is happening and it's very uncomfortable and it's um, something that I was concerned about. Um, but it would happen on and off. You know, I'd have periods of months where nothing would happen. And then I would have these sort of flare up type things. And so um, it was just kind of something that went into the back of my mind. But as I got a little bit older and, you know, like early 20s ish, I started it started becoming more frequent. And I was thinking more about this, like, why is this happening to me? It was based around any time I was eating something shortly after that. You know, and then days after that, I would have have these gut attacks. And so I kind of always knew that diet had something to do with this because it was always around food. You know, it was right after I'm eating or different things that I was eating seemed to affect it in some way. And so I, I really just sort of took the approach of trying to learn more about diet and nutrition and, you know, what things were good for me, what things were good for gut health and, you know, how I could probably try or try to solve this a little bit on my own. I did see some doctors from time to time throughout this whole whole journey. We can talk about that too, but um, I didn't really receive a whole lot of help in that fashion that, that actually did work for me. So when I sort of began this research into diet, I found, you know, whole food, vegetarianism. So... I was researching into diet and I found, you know, vegetarian, whole food, lots of fiber. That's the type of stuff that I came across first. And I uh, thought, okay, I just need to increase my fiber. I need to eat more like whole grains, more vegetables, like keep it clean, like take the processed foods out and things like that. But, um, you know, I started going down like the plant-based vegetarian path and I would try that for like as long as I could and I felt like things were getting worse and so then I'd kind of back off and think well, okay well this is still making sense to me like this is what's supposed to work so then I would try it again and so I was kind of on and off this vegetarian then I would get stricter and I ended up um, going you know fruit and vegetable mainly fruit vegan for it only lasted a couple of months because my symptoms got so bad I was on the verge of like having these events at work where I was feeling like I was going to black out, potentially pass out. And so um, I thought, well, this is not working right now. And so I can't, I can't function like this. And so that's around the time I did talk to a friend of mine and she said, Hey, I'm getting these, I have kind of the same issue as you and I'm getting these colonic treatments. And so I started going to get those from, you know, a professional who, who gives them. And I was getting those once a week and that gave me some information. This person told me that I had, you know, a lot of candida type symptoms, a lot of yeast buildup. 
Um, and those helped a little bit, like they just literally flush out your colon, um, but it wasn't resolving the underlying problem. I was still having the symptoms. I was still, if I didn't go get those regularly, everything would just go back to the way it was. And so they also made me extremely tired. You know, there was like a couple day period after that where I was just extremely fatigued and wiped out feeling. And so, you know, not sustainable. Um, and then about, so I would, was kind of continuing to do those, but I kept kind of reading into more about what I could eat differently. But I kept thinking that this plant-based way was, was the way that I should, that should be working for me. Um, and then, you know, shortly after that was when I started really getting these psoriasis flare-ups and I had the worst one, um, that I've ever had to date, which was, uh, like gutate psoriasis. So it's the little kind of round spots, not really the plaque psoriasis. Um, but it was all over my entire body. I looked like a leopard. Like I had spots everywhere. Um, and I was working, I worked in bars and restaurants for, you know, my career before I became a mom. And so I was in front of people all the time and it was really embarrassing. And so I finally went to the dermatologist after a couple weeks of that and it wasn't improving. And, you know, they prescribed a, a steroid cream and things like that. But there were several interns or, you know, students in there with the dermatologist. So she kind of went over the spiel. Here's what you need to do. Put the creams on, things like that. And then after the students left, she pulled me aside and she said, hey, you know, I'm not supposed to tell you this. This is not what I'm supposed to recommend to you. But what would really help is if you got out in the sun, you know, and you just expose your, your skin to the sun. Don't wear sunblock. And I thought, well, that's weird. Like, why did why did she have to wait till everyone left before she could tell me that, you know? And so I lived in Florida at the time, plenty of sun. And so I did that. I put the cream on and I also went out in the sun and the spots went away. And I didn't have another flare up of that for a few years. But then ever since then, I would just kind of get three or four spots in the winter um, and then they'd kind of just go away on their own. And I could never really pinpoint exactly what was causing that. But during this time, um, I was also drinking a lot of alcohol, doing a lot of partying because that was associated, you know, highly with the lifestyle in bars and restaurants. And I was in my mid 20s. And so I was also doing a lot of things lifestyle wise that were not healthy either that I definitely think contributed. Um, but I kind of got to this point where I was afraid to eat because I, every time I ate, something happened. It was affecting me socially. It was affecting my work situation. I had to leave work to go to the ER one time because I was like doubled over in, in pain and I thought I was dying and they couldn't find anything like an obstruction, anything like that. And so that's kind of when I had this breaking point where I thought, okay, there's, there's gotta be something I'm missing here. And that's when I stumbled into paleo and ancestral eating and I cut out grains and that's the first time that I started noticing any significant change really whatsoever that lasted more than a week or two. So I noticed the brain fog I was having was starting to improve. I wasn't having as much bloating and as many, you know, pain and symptoms. And um, that, you know, there's there's a lot more that I could fill in here, but es essentially that was the, the major changing point. And then I slowly started eliminating more and more things. I tried the FOBNET. FODMAP diet, the GAPS protocol. And then I was down to basically eating salads and meat and a few vegetables like cucumbers and olives. And I was like really busy for a couple weeks and I found myself just kind of grabbing meat out of the fridge when I was rushed to get in a meal. And it took me a few days to, to realize it, but I was like, I don't think I had any symptoms the last few days after I've just eaten the meat. And then that, that's when the light bulb went off and I thought, well, maybe that's what this is. Maybe I can only tolerate meat. And then me, I started me, looking online. Yeah, let me, before you before you go into this part, let me just ask you a little backing up on when you developed the gutate, the gutate psoriasis, you know, the spotted psoriasis, were you, what was your diet at the time? You know, when you, it seemed like it, you know, that, that increased it to some degree, I guess, the problems. It was, it was still more on like the whole foods plant-based side i had not okay. yet adopted like an ancestor i hadn't cut the grains out okay so you're still um, and, and the ibs mm -hmm. was were the severity of the ibs at the same time worse when that was going on or was it or could you notice a difference or do you most think? definitely yeah because i was eating lots of fiber i was taking fiber pills um 
I had a doctor tell me to just continue to do that, even though I went in there saying like, I ended up in the ER parking lot a few times because I thought like, I felt like I was going to explode. Like, and then I ended up vomiting in the parking lot and I felt better. And so I went home, you know what I mean? But like this, all that stuff was leading up to before I thought, okay, this, like what I've been doing is not working and I have to find a different approach. And that's when I yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the fact that the, 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 the student or the resident told you, um, you know, to get out in the sun, that, I mean, that's not that controversial because light therapy and, and psoriasis has been known about for years. I learned about that in medical school, you know, many, many years ago. So it's uh, mm-hmm. I'm surprised I had to kind of whisper it to you, I guess. Me um, too. But, but uh, interesting. So, and I mean, you know, and why that is, don't know, maybe it has to do with vitamin D, hydroxylation or something perhaps could be a thought, but um certainly has helped other people. All right. So you, and I guess just during this whole time, I'm assuming none of the physicians, well, I mean, IBS can be divided in different subtypes. IB, IB, uh, you know, IBSC, IBSD, IBS combined. Did they get into that with you? And did they do like uh, endoscopies, colonoscopies, all, all those types of things? Or how far into the diagnostic spectrum did you get? I did not get very far. And, you know, probably the reason for that is that I, I just kind of had this in my head that I could figure this out and I could um, solve this with diet or with natural or lifestyle interventions. And so I would kind of go in when I was at these acute stages of being really afraid or having like a flare up that was very frightening. Um, So I've had like a CT scan done. I've been to the emergency room one other time. Um, and so I, but I did not pursue that into like seeing a, a gastroenterologist, which I probably should have. Um, but just from, like, I would say just from what I have learned, it was definitely constipation related for the, like the first probably 10 years. And then it sort of progressed into this combination where I would have alternating um, periods. And, and that was where I started fasting more, trying to, you know, give my gut a break that would that would help but then I would you know then I started restricting and binging because I just it just really messed up my relationship with food and how I was feeling about eating and being afraid to eat and so there was like that whole mental component and I I could feel sort of around this time too it was like the mental health aspect of things got pretty low you know because I just thought I don't know. And I, I did talk to a couple other people who had similar symptoms as me and they had not gotten really any, you know, who had been through kind of the system of seeing all the specialists and, and like that, and they had not had any resolution. And so I kind of didn't see a, a hopeful pathway to pursue that. And, and so. It, it's probably pretty safe to assume that had you gone to a gastroenterologist, they probably would have not have recommended an animal based or carnivore diet. That's probably pretty safe to bet. There's probably you know, just a handful of gastroenterologists yeah. in the world that would recommend that. I know some of them, but uh, probably unlikely that would be the case. Uh, did they, among your uh, ER visits or any hospital or medical um, interactions you had, did, did anybody recommend to you eat more fiber, or eat more plants? Was that was that part of the thing that you'd heard maybe in the ER perhaps? Um, it was the one time I did seek out just a general practitioner. Um, this was probably, this was probably post paleo. So I probably wasn't even to keto, um, yet where I had really cut out a lot of things, but I did go see a woman and she, um, I was explaining all of this to her, like, and I'm taking a fiber supplement at that time. I was taking like 12 fiber pills a day in three different, you know, broken up doses plus eating dietary fiber. Um, although I had removed the grains and I was telling him like, you know, these sometimes produce a bowel movement, but it might be once every week or every two weeks and it's painful. And, you know, there's things that are very unpleasant and scary that are happening. And her response was to say that, you know, um, if, if the pills are giving you the result that you want, then just continue to take them. And I thought, (laughs) did you listen to like the last 10 minutes of, you know, 20 minutes of things that I've been explaining, like, yeah, but that's not, you know, that's not solving my problem. I'm still in sometimes debilitating pain and I can't go to work sometimes and I'm so tired and like all these other things are compounding and, you know, I need help. And that was not the answer I wanted. How was your weight at that time? Were you, were you underweight, overweight? I mean, normal weight? How how did your body respond? Because it sounds like you had a hard time 
eating mm-hmm. was, I, I guess. Um, I've n- never really had a significant weight issue. I'd say I've probably over my lifespan, I've maybe fluctuated perhaps 20 pounds more than I am currently. So um, right now I'm between like 120, 125. I think maybe 135, 140 might have been the heaviest that I that I was at different points throughout like my 20s. Um, and I'm sure a lot of that was fluid and a lot of it was inflammation and things like that too because that, that would fluctuate. Um, like I'd have different pant sizes in my closet depending on like how bloated I was. So I'd have to literally like have different sizes of, of wardrobe too. You know, I see that. a lot of, you know, particularly in some sort of, I guess, women's health fitness space, they talk about bloating being normal and it's just, oh, it's just normal, you know, it's supposed to. Uh, I assume you disagree with that these days, but uh, was that something you kind of were told that bloating is just kind of normal and, you know, that's just that's, that's the way it is type of thing? That's That's definitely something I've heard people say, um, you know, other women say, and I've seen, I I don't remember, this was maybe a few months back, I saw a, a YouTube short or something where this girl was trying to fit into this very form-fitting dress, and it's like, you know, this is what everyone thinks I look like, and then she relaxes her stomach, and she's extremely bloated, and it's like, well, this is normal, you know, this is real life, and this is what, you know, we should kind of just accept this as normal, and I I would disagree with that. I don't think that in general, you know, being chronically bloated like that or having being that bloated after every meal that you eat is normal at all. That's that's a sign of dysbiosis. It's a sign of you are not processing and digesting your food correctly. And that is that's the first thing that I noticed when I went pure carnivore. That went away. And I thought, okay, I must be doing something right finally. What year about approximately, if you can remember, was it when you made the transition over to more paleo and then a ketogenic type of diet? Do you remember how long ago that was? Um, that was, I'd say that was when I was probably 25, 26, and I'm 37, so about maybe 10, 10 years ago. Yeah. All right. And so you kind of gradually whittled your way down to meat and some kind of green salads or leafy greens or green vegetables or something like that. How long, how did that do for you and how long did, did that, that last for you and what were the issues you had with that? That was basically the result of um, trying to go low carb keto and hearing that lot, you know, hearing more about grains and how bad those were for digestion. I started learning about potential celiac, things like that. And so, um, but then I was still eating like cruciferous, broccoli, kale, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, all that kind of stuff. And then I learned about FODMAPs. And so that's when I was like, okay, all these cruciferous have to go. That's probably, you know, onions, garlic, all that stuff. So then the salad thing I did for quite a while, I'd say it was probably about a year, uh, mostly eating that way. And I was feeling better, but so the salad thing was probably about a year of doing that. And I would have some good days where I didn't feel too bad, um, but I would still be noticing that because, you know, I was kind of eating like one meal a day. I was trying to do the fasting thing because I thought that was good too, but I would just be so incredibly tired and I would still get the bloating after I was eating these giant salads. And I thought, you know, I just don't want, I don't want this bloating anymore. It's not right. And then I, that's kind of when I was still having this combination. So it was more on the IBSD side of things where it would just be, cause I was doing a lot of home enemas. That's the other thing I was doing at this point. And so I was kind of like surviving off of these enemas because I would do them almost daily, usually every other day. And so a lot of it was just, you know, those were helping, but it's like, again, that's not sustainable. I can't function well after I do those. And so I was kind of limping along on salads and, and enemas. And then, um, yeah, the, the just by happenstance, there were a few days in a row that I just ate meat out of just pure busyness and didn't have time to throw the salad together. And then I was like, wait a minute, I feel fine now. Or, you know, I'm not getting the bloating. I'm not getting the diarrhea. I'm not feeling like, you know, I need to take a three hour nap after I, after I ate a meal. So when you when you discovered that meat by itself was <clears throat> relatively well tolerated for you didn't didn't have these IBS symptoms, when was that approximately? Do you remember that? That was um, about two, I want to say twenty eighteen because that was right around the time that was that right when you had your episode on Joe Rogan 
Yeah, um, somewhere around end, that end same of 2017 time. 2017 was when I, I was in December. Okay. December 7th, actually. It was, it was Pearl Harbor Day, as I recall. Uh, but on December 7th, 2017. So, so yeah, so maybe maybe there was a little bit of information about carnivore diets. It just it started to come out at that point. Mm-hmm. Yep, I saw your episode, and then I, I saw Michaela Peterson, and I had also found this blog called Zero Carb Zen online, where it was a, a woman's story of getting to only meet, basically, and I resonated you know, very heavily with her story of trying all these weird experimental diets and things like that, and so I thought, wow, you know, that's a thing. It's called the carnivore diet, and people are just eating meat, and then it, you know, mostly from that gut health perspective, I was finding more and more you know, as, as years went on about, you know, or that time period went on about this really working for people. And so I was on it about 11 months and I got pregnant and then everything changed. So, um, yeah, and there's probably, again, like a lot of variables that go into that, but I had, I mean, I cut out alcohol and coffee, cold turkey at that point. And then, because I had still been drinking a lot of alcohol, and I know that that is a factor, you know, as far as gut health and things go. But um, so when I got pregnant, you know, I stopped drinking, stopped caffeine. And so I just felt terrible for, you know, the first three, four months. I couldn't really stomach anything, everything, meat, vegetables, fruit, everything smelled disgusting. So I just kind of had trouble keeping anything down. And then the second half, I kind of just ate you know, essentially whatever I wanted. I did a pretty a pretty good job, but I my main focus was to keep it low fiber because I knew fiber was what just wrecked me. And so I ate meat, seafood, um, some low fiber vegetables, and I kind of just got got through that phase. But then post pregnancy, I started having some like hypoglycemic type events that I had never had before, um, and there I also that was a very high stress period of my life. And so between stress and not taking care of myself properly this past summer, um, you know, June, July, I just felt like something snap. I was like, it's hor- like felt like hormones. It's just like I was on the couch. I couldn't get up. I just was like so incredibly tired. Um, and I thought I have to go back, you know, to eating carnivore because it's the only thing that has helped me progress because my IBS symptoms never returned with the full force that they had pre carnivore. And so I know some healing had taken place, but I just, with my lifestyle at the time, I was just not committed enough to my own health to, to be strict enough. And so I kind of recommitted to myself again this last July. I'm like, I need to do this if I want to be a good mother, if I want to be a good partner, if I want to be who the person I know I am, I need to, to do this. And so I've been on it eight months and now I'm back on the lion diet, which we can talk about too, the reasons for that if you want, but. Well, I mean, go back back to the original 11 months where you said, you know, I finally decided to go, you know, meat face until you got pregnant. Symptoms got better, I assume. I mean, you felt yes, pretty good, right? I mean, no, no more IBS, no more skin issues, no more brain fog. Is that, is that fair to say or? Yeah, that's fair to say. I had no IBS symptoms at all. Um, almost from day one, there was a transition period of like a couple weeks, um, where I lost a lot of fluid. Um, but I did the electrolytes and I, I didn't even, I don't even think I was eating that high fat of fat. I just ate meat till I was full. It was simple and easy. And, um, I had no symptoms at all. I had no psoriasis. I had no, um, like my brain fog went away. I felt more mentally clear than ever. And I, I didn't even realize how sort of apathetic and potentially depressed I was until, and and anxiety too was one of the things that I had pretty bad, you know, social anxiety and things like that throughout my journey. And so I didn't even realize like how much those things were affecting me until that first 11 month period where I was like, oh, this is, this is Nia, you know, like this is who's been underneath this whole time. And so, yeah, it, it felt like a miracle at that point. When, uh, how long did it take? I mean, I assume you were, you regained normal bowel functions because you said you had, you know, weeks and weeks with difficult bowel movements, enemas. I mean, how long did it take for that sort of to normalize or, or, or assuming it did? did? Did that take a while for the bowel movements to normalize? Um, I'd say about 30 days in that initial time frame. Like, I, yeah, there was a good two week period where, you know, it was a lot of, a lot of fluid coming out. Um, but, 
within 30 days, I was having normal, I'd say every other day, one um, normal, non-painful, non, you know, there's no struggle around it. Uh, just I go and I'm done every other day, sometimes once a day um, and no bloating in between. Yeah, that must have uh, been quite a relief, I would imagine, to, to get yeah. to that point. Um, what, what were you eating at that time? You know, because some people that struggle with constipation, the, the amount of fat can be, if it's too little, it can be a problem. If it's too much, it can be a problem. Do you remember kind of what you were eating back then? <laughs> I would say I was eating mostly beef and I ate a lot of sashimi, just raw fish, because um, I worked at a, a sushi restaurant. And so um, I had access to, you know, well-prepared, really nice fish. And so I would eat that probably two, three times a week. Um, but it was mostly meat, but I did eat chicken and bacon. Um, a lot of bacon in the beginning. And then I, would you know, get those whole chickens sometimes or roast a whole chicken and eat that. Um, but I'd say like mostly ground beef, chicken, bacon, and raw fish. Okay. Okay. So not like a super high amount of fat. I mean, there was mm -mm. a decent amount, but what you wouldn't say you're focusing on just eating massive amounts of fat then. Okay. Yeah, so I didn't you got pregnant. Fat. Yeah. So you got pregnant you used first trimester, you just, everything was like, yeah, <laughs> don't eat any of that. that, that I've, I've seen that many times. I mean, it's very common for them to have, you know, a lot of food aversions during pregnancy and sometimes cravings. And that first, first, you know, eight, 10, 12 weeks can be really tough with that. Um, when you were pregnant, you ate kind of a mixed diet. I mean, I assume it was relatively healthy. Did you still consume a lot of animal products during your pregnancy? I did. I had probably more dairy. That's something I craved a lot of um, than I've ever eaten in my, you know, or consumed in my life. Um, and I, I joke that's why my little one loves ice cream is because mama ate <laughs> some ice cream towards the end there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I ate a lot of meat, still a lot of beef, um, especially in the last couple of months, I'd say last three months. Um, and then I just was very afraid of fiber. So anything that was high in fiber, I stayed away from. Most grains I stayed away from. Um, <clears throat> but yes, yeah, still plenty of animal products, some low fiber vegetables and um, dairy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And pregnancies went okay, I guess. I mean, normal. Healthy, mm -hmm. healthy. You got you got two. Yeah. I I, how many said you had? How many kiddos do you have? Just just one, yeah, okay. just yeah. one right now. Okay. Yep, we had a, a home birth and it was perfect. Okay, awesome, awesome. And then so so after pregnancy, you stayed on this sort of mixed diet for a period of time until. And then what, what happened that made you want to go back on the, on the more carnivore diet? What was it? I can't remember what you said. What's going on? I, you know, I guess I, I've, I've always had this hope that I could, the mindset that I was in was like, well, maybe I healed, maybe just doing it for 11 months was what my body needed. And now I can add things back in and I can kind of be normal, you know, again, and eat like everybody else. And so I, I think there was a big part of me that wanted that, that wanted to just kind of go back to the way I, you know, way I felt like eating and that I could be okay with that. And so I kind of fought that for a while, um, restricting, you know, restricting back to really low carb again and then thinking, oh, I can get away with this or that. But it would either trigger me into a sugar binge, which is something that I did struggle with in the past as well, like restricting and binging, or it would... Um, you know, I'd get a psoriasis flare up or I'd have a gut flare up or something would happen. And I'm like, nope, I, you know, I can't, I can't do this. So I'd have this kind of flip flopping thing going back and forth. And, you know, that's, that's just kind of what I struggled with. And then once we, we moved in the spring, we've been here in Texas almost a year. Um, so this past summer, I just like I don't really know what it was. I know some people say adrenal fatigue is is not a real thing. Some people say that it is, but that is the thing that resonates with me most. It's just like something snapped inside me. Like I just I lost all my energy. I was just anxiety through the roof. Um you know, feeling like I just wanted to cry some days for no reason. Like I just I think it was stress and then, you know, lack of a, of a good diet and whatever, you know, I've had so many, so many years of in being highly inflamed and having probably gut damage. And so 
I just had to come to this point where I was like, I'm not healed yet, you know, and I need to, I need to go back to what works or I'm going to fall apart. You know, when you said, I want to eat like normal people, like, like everybody else, what did that mean to you? Did that mean like eat what the average American eats, which is, or is it just like, I want to eat like fruits and vegetables and rice and I mean, what were you trying to do? Where is it, where was it like, I'm just going to eat whatever I want to eat type of thing? No, I, I definitely don't. No, not like processed food and, and sodas and things like that. But I just wanted to have more variety. I just want to be able to like go out to eat and not have to be super particular and worried about every little thing I put in my mouth. <clears throat> um, you know, my fiance is a chef and so like, and he loves food. And so like, it's kind of been part of our lifestyle to have food experiences and try things from different cultures and, you know, things like that. And so that was just something that I thought, oh, maybe I can do this once in a while and have an off plan meal, but it just, it would always trigger something. And so I've just had to come to terms with, you know, I can't, I can't go very far off plan into vegetable or carb land. Was it, was the gut the first thing that you always noticed? Was it like immediate gut pain and then maybe psoriasis followed that or how did that play out for you? Um, gut is always the first thing Then I can usually tell in my skin either, um, like right here, I'll get inflamed red. You can see it's a little bit right now, but, um, this area will, will flare up. Um, not necessarily, not necessarily with psoriasis, but just, you know, you can tell. Um, and then I notice now since I've had that period of contrast in my mental health, that 11 month period where I was like, I feel happy. Like, this is what it's like to experience, you know, happiness and stuff just, for no reason, um, I notice a, a major shift in my mood. So I will be much more apt to look at things negatively or feel anxiety or hyper, you know, be hyper stressed about things. So yeah, I n definitely notice now. Okay. So you, how, and how long of a period since I, I can't remember because your daughter sounds like she's a couple, maybe a couple, couple years, maybe. So a couple of years of just sort of a mixed diet and then, and then decide, Hey, it's just not working for me. I got to go back. Is that, is that the time frame? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd say about three years. And then there were, there were a few month periods in there where I was carnivore, but you know, not, not a significant period. Okay. Well, and you know, you, if you have a, you know, you know, a partner, a fiance, who's a chef, uh, I assume, I mean, does he cook meat for you or how does that work? Um, yeah, I mean, we both cook and he works a lot of hours. He's actually very helpful. Um, and so like breakfast is our kind of family time. Um, cause he works in, you know, afternoon till late at night. And so I'll usually cook breakfast, but, um, yeah, he'll, he'll also cook, but he likes to go, you know, go out to eat sometimes and try different places and, you know, eat a lot of different things that he can tolerate. And so sometimes I'm just like, why can't I eat cucumbers, you know, or something and every once in a while, but, um, yeah. Um, okay. So she go back to a more carnivorous and now onto a line, which is basically the diet. What, what, what prompted that or how did that go? What, how did that evolve? Um, it is, is kind of, the extension of, you know, why I went back to carnivore this the second time is that I, again, like I get these these long periods where I feel like I'm doing really great. But then if I introduce cheese, I will get all of those, you know, aforementioned symptoms start to come up again. And I've not been sure about seafood. I feel like sometimes that might be doing something or maybe it's not or maybe chicken is or maybe pork is and I can't really tell. And so I did 30 days of lion in January and cut out coffee because that's the other thing. I was like completely complete caffeine addict, like drinking a pot and a half of coffee a day, just strung out on caffeine. And so I whittled that down to decaf and then cut that out in January and my energy improved, but it, it wasn't stellar yet. Um, and so, you know, I've just, again, kind of come to the conclusion that I, I haven't gone restricted enough for long enough to really see like what what does my body still need to heal from and and give it that space to do that before i start even introducing other carnivore foods okay and how are you doing today with i guess the lion diet are you doing pretty good yeah i'm actually yeah. feeling really good um coffee was probably the the hardest thing to give up last 
um because that was that was really a crutch for me to just get through life and um but you know again for whatever's going on with my hormones i feel like that that was definitely contributing so that was hard but i'm like on day nine today and i feel great like i've been waking up in the morning with energy where i don't feel like oh can i go get some coffee or even some decaf like i just get up and start doing things and that's that's weird and um the bloating is gone i had a little bit of because i had introduced raw dairy also about a month ago thinking because a lot of people say that helps their their ibs gut symptoms and that did not go well for me and so i think there was a little bit of like okay we're clearing out this this dairy that i had um but yeah i'm feeling great now and i'm gonna do it at least 90 days this time and then decide if i want to try to reintroduce so yeah i'm feeling really good well, good luck with that. That's interesting. Yeah, that's, uh, I always kind of feel best on just straight up beef. I mean, I do that all the time. I've done it for years on end in many cases. But um, so, how does the rest of the family? I mean, I mean, obviously, you got a little, a little, I, I guess, a little, little girl. I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, does it has this experience with you impacted how you feed her? And for instance, absolutely. <clears throat> um, she is. I would say ketogenic most of the time i mean she's not a strict carnivore but we you know i don't even keep vegetables in the house except for like onions because because my fiance he likes steak onions on his steak um and so sometimes mushrooms or things like that but other than that we don't really have any vegetables in the house um no grains except for like emergency food storage you know end of the world type stuff if that's all that was left we'd have some rice but um so i make you know eggs and uh scrambled eggs and butter and bacon for breakfast for her every day she loves that um she eats a lot of like full fat cottage cheese she loves milk still um so yeah she's heavily meat-based and but there is there are challenges with that because um you know we live in a world that's bombarded constantly with kids that want to share their their treats and their chips and their things like that and so people want to give her candy and stuff around holidays and things like that so there are times where you know those things will come in and i notice a night and day difference in in her behavior and and you can see that in a child how addictive this stuff is sometimes we you know people say like oh carb addiction's not real or sugar addiction's not real but watch a kid when you try to take candy away from a kid it's like she'll talk about it for a day or two days afterwards if she knew something i hid something from her up here it's like she knows it, you know, and she'll she'll throw a fit sometimes. So, I mean, it's it's kind of a hard world to navigate. But she's definitely meat based, and and she's she's super smart. She just turned four. Um, she can read. Like I'm teaching her to read. Um, she's learning Spanish. She's you know she's a great kid. Oh, good, kind of like me. I'm in Spanish too, so. <laughs> I know. You know, I'm like I can practice now. <laughs> well, you're in, te well, in Texas. It's, it's helpful. Well, a yeah, lot of, a lot of places in the U.S. is quite helpful, to be honest. But um, so, in your personal, you know, I guess social group, I mean, I'm sure friends, family, whatever. Anybody else, you know, agree, disagree? Anybody else doing carnivore? Do you know anybody? I mean, I, I know you have an online. I guess a YouTube thing and stuff like that, which is a little different. But what about your personal, this local environment? You know, um, I would say, I always make the joke, well, I don't have any friends anymore, so it's really easy. Um, but not being in, you know, the restaurant environment where I was working, you know, that actually makes things a lot easier because I don't have to explain things a lot. And, and nobody really ever gave me any grief over it because everybody, you know, I think people noticed a change in me too in my work environment the first time I went carnivore. Um, they just noticed I was faster and sharper and things like that. So nobody really questioned it. Um, there were a couple of, of vegan people there too. So it's just something like we just didn't talk about really. But um, I would say, you know, everybody in my life knows that I eat this way and, and the reasons that I do um, and knows the journey that I've been through. And so no one really you know, gives me a hard time about it. But I, I haven't quite convinced anyone else to like totally jump in and go carnivore, which, which I, I wish that I could. But, you know, you can't you can't push push this on on people because that that never really works. So I try to just 
you know, lead by example, I guess. How, um, you know, you're in Texas, which there's a lot of beef in Texas for sure. How, how, how do you, do you find it pretty easy in Texas? I mean, is there anything easier in Texas? I mean, there's obviously there's a lot of barbecue places and beef is pretty prominent there, but how's it, how is it in Texas with carnival? Pretty, pretty, pretty good. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah. I mean, when we, uh, we didn't know where we were going to move and when we kind of decided, okay, we're going here, I thought, perfect. You know, it's, it's like a, what's the symbol, like beef, you know, longhorns or something like symbol of the state. So yeah, there's, um, there's barbecue everywhere. I have to be careful because I, you know, if anything has seasoning on it, I, and or sauce, I still avoid that. But um, we have the best sales on meat. I feel like meat is very affordable here in relationship to other places I've lived. Like I get, uh, I'm always astonished. Like my Tom, we have Tom Thumbs here and Kroger, and then I have a Sam's and a, you know Walmart that I also shop at. So um, Tom Thumb every single week they've got steak, some type of steak on sale for like five to six dollars a pound. Sometimes like six ninety nine, but they're always something. We've had whole ribeyes here for three fifty, three forty six a pound. I get ground beef for around four dollars a pound all the time in bulk rolls and even in like value packs on sale at the grocery store. So I just find it to be, yeah, very friendly. You know, there, it's always in stock, and I I think it's very affordable also around here. Yeah, I, have, I don't go to Dallas that much, but I, I go to Houston, and whenever I visit my my family a little bit, live in Houston, I'll go grocery shopping, and, and usually yes. I find it to be. Re- pretty reasonable for the most part so that's that's yeah that's good to see so tell me a little bit about your online what prompted i guess your youtube channel was that just something you felt like what what is what is it what is that the focus of the youtube channel and why did you why did you start that i um i actually had a channel during my first round of carnivore and i started talking about that and i've always been into fitness too i've been certified as a personal trainer and a group fitness instructor and I'm interested in um, you know functional movement and restorative movement and stuff and so I was started a channel based around that and I ended up quitting that um, and then started again because I thought uh, and I actually started it again and I was documenting um, this off-grid experience that we had so uh, you know between having our baby and where we are now we lived off the grid for like 18 months and so I started my channel to document that and then, you know, I switched over to to documenting my health journey again because I, you know, the first time I got a lot of comments and people had a lot of questions and I got a lot of criticism and I I took a lot of it personally and because I didn't know the answers, you know, I didn't know why taking fiber away helped my microbiome, you know, when everybody else says you need all this fiber and stuff to have a healthy gut, you know, and I didn't know the answer and so I just thought, well, guys, like, I'm just telling you, this is what happened. And so I kind of, I took a lot of that to heart and thought, well, maybe I'm not qualified to share because I'm not a doctor and I'm not a dietitian and I'm, I'm not all these things. But then as, you know, and, and that off-grid experience really taught me a lot about what it's, you know, how hard the world can be and how comfortable we are as, as humans now. And what it means if you don't have your health. And if you're not fundamentally healthy, you cannot perform at your best. You can't be who you are. You can't show up in life as the best version of yourself. And that experience was very, very difficult. The the off-grid experience, I'm glad I had it, but it was extremely trying. And it, it kind of made me realize that I needed to share my story and I needed to not be afraid to share it because there are a lot of people that suffer in silence like I did. And there are a lot of people that don't want to talk about it. And there are a lot of people that think that their mental health is fine when maybe it's not and don't get help. And so if I can just be one more anecdote out there to encourage someone or just plant that seed, like, Hey, there's hope for you. You know, you can change your life. If you change your diet, it could happen for you and try to be as honest and truthful as I can about the struggles that I still do have and you know how I'm I'm still working to eliminate until I can heal you know and give my body the time. And so if I can change one person's life with my story, you know, that that would mean everything because I know how hard it is to feel alone and like nobody understands what you're going through and to feel so frustrated and distraught with the system, the medical system that we're in. 
And so that's why I decided to switch my content over and, and share about carnivore. Yeah. Your point about, you know, living off grid or, you know, if, if we are so much more re responsible for feeding ourselves and sheltering ourselves and, you know, pr producing energy and water and all those types of things that might go on being off grid, it, it's harder when you're sick, you know, and it's, it, you know, it's hard enough when you're healthy, but when you're mm -hmm. sick and that's how you think about most people had to live in sort of s similar fashion for a long time with regard to, um, you know, being able to provide for yourself in a, in a really meaningful way. Nowadays, you can literally swipe left on your phone and get food delivered to your house. It's not, it's not, it's so much easier to be a human and therefore you don't need to be, you can, you can literally just kind of exist in this sick state and, and, and survive and still survive, exactly. which is not, would not have been possible even, even a hundred years ago in many cases. Um, where, did, where were you off grid at? And, and can you maybe just share some of the struggles that or interesting things that, that occurred during that? If you, I know it's, we don't have much time, but maybe spend a minute or two on that. Yeah. So it's an interesting story. Um, so um, Arizona primarily, well, Arizona for the entire time, but two different places in Arizona. One was on um, some land that we were able to stay on in like the high desert. So it was like 4,500, 5,000 elevation. And then the other half of it was in Flagstaff, Arizona, where it was like almost, uh, I think it was like 10,000 feet, somewhere around there. And so, yeah, and the year we were there, we had, they had a record snowfall winter. So like we were buried in snow. So I, I, I had some help, but I designed a, I got a school bus and, you know, had help with the demo and everything, but re-renovated that into an RV, an off-grid RV in about three to four months. And my dad helped me design, you know, like put things together and build things. And I had some help with like the power tools and stuff. But um, we had solar power and diesel heat, uh, a wood stove, small, tiny wood stove heater, um, and some other things that we had to rely on. But I hauled water um, and, you know, dispose of our own gray water, compost toilet, um, trash. We had to, you know, take care of all our own trash. And um, so, and I was, and Ben and I were separated at that point. So he was work. So like there was a, <laughs> there's like, it's a whole story. And I used to have videos on my channel, which I took down or I made private because I showed my little girl a lot and I was kind of debating like, well, maybe I should not do that. And so I'm thinking about you know, editing those again and kind of editing her out, her face out, and then re-uploading them because I, I documented quite a bit on there. But um, we essentially could not find a place to live. Um, and in the situation where, you know, being in restaurants post, you know, in this pandemic time, things were very uncertain and volatile. And so that is the solution that we came up with because we could not find affordable housing and um, weren't sure if we were going to lose the housing that we could could attain due to other reasons and so that is the solution that that we came up with and so i was primarily doing that with the little one and he was working and paying all the bills and then we got together back together in flagstaff but went through this crazy winter where we got buried in snow and it was insanity and then um then we moved to texas now we live in an apartment in the city so it's quite a contrast but it, it just yeah it just opens your eyes to like this is this was reality for human beings, you know, not that long ago and how far we have come as far as being dependent and reliant on systems that are fragile and whether that's the grid or our food system or, you know, our, our the ways that we communicate and relate to each other. All of that is, I think, in the balance here uh, over, you know, the decisions that we make as a culture over the next couple of decades and so you know now that I have a kid I realize that you know it's not just me in my life it's the next generation and what kind of situation am I leaving for her and that's the other main reason why I wanted to share and talk on my channel is because you know I got a kid to think about now yeah I mean I, I guess that experience it opens your eyes in a, in, a, in a huge way and you think about if you know you talk about these fragile systems the food system the electrical grid transportation systems perhaps they, they, they were, were to go down God, you know, God forbid if they were, many, many people would not survive that. I think, you know, there's a lot of people that would quickly realize how kind of useless they are really when it comes to, I mean, I don't know that I would. I mean, you know, you got to figure out it's, it's you know, because I, I, I'm dependent upon electricity and, 
you know, climate controlled environments and all these types of things. And, and you know, it, but it's, uh, it's really kind of eye opening to see that. I, I assume that experience as good or as bad as it might have been was something you're probably maybe glad you went through perhaps. I don't know. Maybe not. I don't know. Oh, absolutely. And I, I actually looked forward to it in the beginning. I've always loved camping and outdoors and learning survival skills and all that kind of stuff. So I was, you know, it was very frustrating and um, highly stressful to like get it, get the thing, the project done and get it down there because we weren't even in Arizona at the time. And so, you know, I had to learn how to drive this thing and get a CDL and like go through all this stuff to make this happen. And so it was like highly stressful. But there, there was actually, you know, a period where when we were um, in Arizona on the in the desert side where I, I think I really had some profound healing just emotionally, you know, cause you, you get so into like everything was circadian rhythm, right? I didn't, I woke up with the sun and I'd have all these things that I need, you know, the water, the, you know, the heat system, whatever I need to do in the morning to, to, in order to make coffee or to make breakfast. And then I'd make sure everything was done, you know, and prepared and shut down basically before I went to, you know, before it's dark. Cause after it's dark, it's like, I'm not going to, you know, drain my batteries, my solar on night lights, you know, all night doing stuff. It's like get it all done during the day and go snuggle in bed with with my tater, you know, and read books or watch YouTube videos or whatever still because it's we still have technology. But, um, you know, so like you just get so much more synced in with natural rhythms. And so there was a lot of amazing benefits from it. And, you know, I, I like the feeling of being self-sufficient. I like knowing that I can do hard things and, so, yeah, there are definitely, definitely pros to it, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. You had mentioned uh, earlier you, you were kind of into a fitness type of thing before. Is that still, are you still like a person who likes to exercise, work out? And if so, how has carnival impacted that either positively or negatively? I, I definitely see the value in exercise. I, I definitely have always loved to do that. But this, this past time when I started carnival, I thought like, I'm so, my body's so stressed that I don't think, I couldn't handle any exercise. Like if I tried to do a 15 minute, even moderately intense workout, I'd just be like on the couch for the rest of the day. I could not tolerate it. And so I've kind of backed off a little bit on the intensity and I just do like gentle yoga, stretching, maybe some Pilates a couple times a week if I'm feeling up to it. And I just want to slowly let my body get back into that. But um yeah, I have a specialization in functional movement because I, I really, and I, I love like studying the fascia and like how our bodies are, they're so integrated in ways that we're, we're still not even totally aware of yet. Like a lot of times, um, I don't, I guess I could go off on a tangent on that. So I guess um, that's definitely something I'm still interested in. And I'm, I'm interested in helping people um, who are kind of in this healing process, like I'm still in, you know, find a way to move because obviously walking's great. Um, but that mobility work and, and that functional strength, I think is so important that a lot of us have to retrain and build back up. So that's what I'm hoping to start putting some more classes on my channel uh, in the near future with. Um, we're just about out of time here. So, uh, Mia, can you share maybe the names of your channel or other social media if, you, if you're interested in people finding that? Yeah, um, I'm just on YouTube as of now, and it's Nia's Way on YouTube. I'm thinking about uh, starting it back on Instagram again. That's another one of the things I kind of cut out was like news and tons of social media because it was just stressing me out all the time. So, um, but I, I really enjoy YouTube. I love I love the format there. I love that I can just do live streams and, and just kind of talk and, and, and have a community there. That's really, really been encouraging um, to, to have support and to have other people that can identify with, you know, the journey that I'm on and try to help other people. So that's really where I'm at. I'm at I have a website, uh, niazway.co, which has a couple of digital products, um, but there's nothing else really much on there besides that yet. So, and, and is your audience mostly, is it, is it like moms and stuff like that or who, you know, who the audience typically is? Um, my demographics are actually majorically male, but not by much. Um, I'd say it's like 60, maybe 55, 45, something like that. Um, and I'm starting to see more ladies, uh, in the comments and, um, who have, you know, maybe not all moms, but, um, who have, you know, similar experiences as as i do and um 
yeah, I'd say like my my age ish and perhaps a little bit older than me uh, for the majority. So um, yeah, but I do post videos about a lot of meal prep and like the meals that I make for my family that are you know strict for me and then a little more flexible for them. And so I'm I'm trying to do my best to show kind of the practical day to day. Uh, reality of eating this way and and the affordability of it. So hopefully people can be inspired to they know that it is doable, especially with kids. Yeah. Well. Yeah. This, if you, we've got just as a, as a uh, you know talking about the affordability because a lot of people say it's cost prohibitive. I can never do that. Is that is mm-hmm. that what you found or no? Is it is it just about the same as, as any other diet more or less? I I would say it's more affordable at this point. And it depends on what you buy and it depends on where you live. And like I said, I think, you know, part of it is that I think the prices are in the area that I'm in are probably better than I don't know what the average price per pound of ground beef or steak is in the country. But um, I do get some comments where people are saying, like, how do you afford to buy all that? How do you afford that? So in my videos, I always try to mention the price per pound for things and talk about, you know, when things are on sale and where so that, you know, you kind of, you kind of, you know, have to employ a few strategies when it comes to that. I think just the mindset of, okay, what are you cutting out and how much money are you saving? And then I know I've heard some discussions recently about, you know, when you actually compare, I think it was the cereal thing when that came up, it's like the price per pound of cereal versus beef, you know, it's, it's not even a comparison, you know, with the nutrition that you're getting. So you kind of have to shift your mindset a little bit. And then just, you know, learn to be a good shopper, look for sales, look for bulk stuff, get a membership at Costco or something. And ultimately, you know, choose your health, choose the health of your children, you know, as best you can. I think that's if there's any way to make to make it work, I think we should do our best, you know. Yeah, fair enough. OK, so it's Mia's way on YouTube. Yes. A-H. Mm-hmm. Mia. All right. Mia, thank you so much. Appreciate this. Um, the rest of you guys have a good day. Thanks a bunch. Thank you.